President Yoon suk yeol and main opposition Democratic Party leader Lee Jae-myung met for talks over tea at the Yongsan presidential office Monday afternoon. So what are some of the major takeaways according to foreign correspondents? And what are the implications of Korea's stronger than expected economic growth in the first quarter? Meanwhile, on the regional security front, what is the disruptive technology protection network? Hello and welcome to yet another edition of Issues and Insiders. I'm Min Sun Hee. Today we have our panel of foreign correspondents and their take on regional headlines. For this, I have Melanie Jensen here in the studio. Melanie, it's good to have you back. It's good to be here. I also have Nicholas Rocker with us. Nicholas, as always, welcome. Good to be on the show. Right, Melanie, let's begin with a few domestic headlines here in the country. President Yoon Suk-yeol and opposition party leader Lee Jae-myung met at the presidential office Monday afternoon amid the country's deep partisan divide. What was your takeaway from this meeting? Well, I think um, the it was not really um, a good meeting, even though it uh, lasted for more than two hours. Um, the two leaders couldn't really agree on anything except for the fact that we need more medical students. But apart from that, it seems like they were talking for two hours without really reaching any agreements. Uh, they didn't really make any kind of uh, statements. The Democratic Party afterwards expressed that they were very um, disappointed over the meeting, especially because it was uh, President Jun himself who had called uh, Lee Jae-myung after he suffered um, a pretty big defeat in the um, parliament election uh, in the beginning of of April. So he had been calling Lee Jae-myung um, asking if they could discuss uh, political disagreements. But despite Yoon being the one making the phone call, he didn't really bring anything new to the table. It seemed like he hadn't really changed his, um, his standpoint on, on his political matters. So all in all, it turned out to be um, a very disappointing meeting. And that is also what um, has um, what editors and Korean news media has been expressing afterwards. I read one comment saying, why did you even show up? Or why did he even have this meeting? Why did he bother when nothing has come out of it? Mm, and what are your thoughts regarding the meeting, Nicholas? Well, uh, I, I tend to agree with Melin. I feel like both of them stayed on their position, stood their ground. Uh, I mean, also, probably I didn't expect much of it. We knew that uh, Lee Jae-myung was going to push forward its agenda for a cash handout, for instance, to relieve the, 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 the current inflation. Uh, we don't expect Yoon suk to, to change his foreign, uh, uh, foreign affairs policy, uh, even though, of course, Lee Jae-myung pushed towards the agenda of maybe, you know, uh, the historical uh, disagreement between Seoul and Tokyo, and Tokyo. So, yeah, I didn't expect much. And for now, not much came of it. But I think the big question now is, will anything happen at the National Assembly? Will uh, uh, will the uh, opposition and the People Power Party be able to, you know, find agreement on some specific laws? Uh, and that we will need to, to find out in, uh, in the coming weeks. All right. And I guess that backdrop, we're hoping that they will reach a broad agreement on mm -hmm. the idea of uh, bolstering the economy, of mm -hmm. course. And speaking about the economy, Nicholas, Korea noted a uh, stronger than expected first quarter economic growth. Could you tell us more about this finding, its broader implications? Yeah, it was quite surprising, but the uh, GDP growth for the first quarter was at 1.3 and the uh, initial uh, expectation by the government was 0 0.6. So it's way higher than expected. Uh, pretty good result. It's always nice to have good figures. Uh, but there's a more general question, that is, where does this growth come from? Of course, it's South Korea, so it comes from exports uh, mainly, a big company, um, key products, semiconductors, uh, batteries, but also uh, some high consumption for this uh, first quarter, also boosted by um, the fact that there was a lot of uh, travel, so a lot of people came into Korea. Um, but what I, uh, my question is, will those good figures be enough, you know, to uh, make the South Korean population uh, happy about the actual uh, economic situation in South Korea right now? We know inflation is really high. Uh, and the, the public sentiment probably won't change with uh, those figures because inflation will probably uh, stay high. And uh, I think we need to be cautious because those are quarterly results. They are indeed good, but we measure uh, an economic policy on the long term, of course. And uh, right now, the government is, uh, as, as Manin explained, kind of uh, hand-tied. Uh, there's 
not uh, a lot of expectation that it will be uh, able to push towards its economic agenda. So uh, yeah, I think uh, I think it's good news. It's always better to have those uh, those good results, but we need to be cautious and to wait uh, until the end of the year to see if you know this economic growth is sustainable in the long long run. Right, indeed. And Melanie, on the diplomatic front then, delegates from Seoul, Tokyo and Washington sat down in the US, I believe, last week for the inaugural meeting of the Disruptive Technology Protection Network. For the sake of our viewers who may not be familiar with this network, could you tell us a bit about it? Yes, it is a network that consists of um, Japan, the US and South Korea and it is regarding disruptive technology which means a technology that has a big impact on the national economy. That could be for example semiconductors or biotechnology or artificial intelligence for example. Um, this uh, summit was held because the US has expressed concern about um, the um, this ex export from Korea and Japan of microchips to China. So the United States would like to um, would like Japan and Korea to take more care and like to protect their technology more against well mainly uh, China, Russia and Iran as was mentioned on the summit. Actually um, the US diplomats attending the summit they held um, a quite uh, interesting um, speech where they directly mentioned the threat of China, of Russia and of Iran. Um, so uh, they expressed concern of what they call was China-backed cyber hackers that was trying to um, trying to frame or trying to make fake news about important um, international politicians and big business leaders. So after the summit, um, there was an agreement that Korea and Japan um, and United States would be better at cooperating um, with their um, boosting their exports to each other's countries of these uh, microchips and disruptive uh, technology as a whole. Um, and also that they would be better at protecting the technology um, and keeping it within um, more Western-minded, more democratic countries. Right. Nicholas, also last week, defense authorities from the three countries, that would be Korea, South Korea, Japan and uh, the US, held their 14th defense trilateral talks, virtually that is. Could you tell us a bit about what was discussed? Yes, and what we what we seen is the continuity of uh, the Camp David Declaration of August 2023, uh, trilateral cooperation being enhanced in the defense uh, sector, with the idea behind that those uh, regular meeting and this cooperation has to be institutionalized so that it won't suffer from uh, any change of power either in Washington, uh, Tokyo or here uh, in Seoul. What I, what I thought was uh, noteworthy is uh, uh, in the joint uh, declaration, joint statement, was progress towards an annual uh, named trilateral exercise. And that is an example of uh, institu uh, institutionalizing this uh, relationship. Uh, through the, the joint statement, it seems like this, uh, this cooperation is also an answer to different actors. Uh, the first of them uh, is of, of course China. It's not China is not mentioned directly, but we can we can understand that. Uh, of course, it's it's one of the actors that uh, the, the the three countries are trying to answer. Uh, there's a hints with the of course notorious peace and stability across the Taiwan Straits. Uh, there's also mention of the respect of the Convention of the Law of the Sea. We know that there's been an overwhelming uh, Chinese presence in the South China Sea, close to the Philippines uh, economic zone. Uh, of of course, Russia is also is also mentioned. Uh, its war in Ukraine, the the and and also its relationship to North Korea and. And this uh, defense uh, cooperation is really aiming at answering um you know, North Korean uh, action, North Korean military actions. Uh, it's been mentioned, DPRK is mentioned 10 times in the, in the joint statement. Uh, and the idea is, is still the same, uh, you know, answer to uh, North Korean missile tests, um, answer to its armed delivery uh, to Russia, of course, uh, to these, uh, its evasion of uh, sanctions, uh, the project of a North Korean satellite. And what is in interesting is that this trilateral cooperation is perhaps maybe the, the last uh, place where you know there's a, there's a will to act on uh, the, the DPRK uh, action because we, we've seen now that the United Nations uh, Security Council is, is kind of void uh, when it comes to DPRK, nor China or Russia is really willing 
to apply those sanctions. Uh, it's clearly uh, helping uh, North Korea evade those sanctions uh, quite blatantly, even for Russia. So if those countries want to pursue this uh, policy of sanctions towards uh, North Korea, it's, it's going to be, uh, you know, together. So, so I think that's what we need to look forward in the, in the coming months. Right. And, and in related news, Melania, North Korea, for its part, it has condemned regional efforts, that would include efforts by the U.S., South Korea and Japan, to maintain monitoring of U.N. sanctions against it. What exactly did North Korea say? Well, Pyongyang quite bluntly stated that the more sanctions that would come towards Pyongyang, the more and the more developed they would continue their nuclear weapon uh, programs, the more, um, the more uh, ballistic missiles they would fire, um, the more tests, nuclear tests they would perform. Um, and this is obviously because North Korea feels extremely threatened um, around these uh, tightened, um, tightened relationships between uh, Japan and South Korea and the United States, particularly the uh, military drills that South Korea and the United States are currently performing, is seems like a very big provocation to the North Korean regime. So we have seen um, since the pandemic um, ended, we have seen that Kim Jong-un has fired more and more missiles and done more and more tests, trying to push, um, push the limit to what he can do without provocating um, the West too much and without provocating South Korea too much. So all of this is part of the rising tensions we, we see between particularly South Korea and North Korea, um, also after North Korea um, stopped having their uh, unification policy. Right. And, and talking about North Korea's testings, Nicholas, the regime last week tested a rocket launcher system that pundits claim can target capital Seoul. Could you tell us a bit about this latest weapons testing? Well, this, this latest testing uh, happened on Thursday. Uh, there was this, this rocket test that you mentioned, but also a declaration of Kim Jong-un asking a national defense industrial uh, company to fulfill its annual production plans. It's another hint that, yes, North Korea is producing more weapons for itself, but also producing more weapons probably to send to Russia because the, the weapons that, that you mentioned that have been tested, it's 240 millimeter uh, rocket shells. Uh, and we found those uh, kind of weapon also uh, in, in, in Ukraine. Uh, so uh, it's, yeah, it's part of those, uh, those two factors. Um, this weapon probably can put uh, Seoul and Greater Seoul under, under threat, but as a lot of different weapons. Now we, we, we've noticed DPRK has uh, various capacities. There, there's the uh, short range uh, ballistic missiles that, that can put so under reach. Uh, there's also cruise missiles, uh, submarine launch uh, ballistic missiles. There's a, you know, there's a like, impressive variety of weapons uh, at Pyongyang's disposal now. What we've also seen uh, last week was uh, the so-called nuclear trigger counterattack exercises uh, that uh, Kim Jong-un oversaw. Uh, basically, it's, it's uh, a presentation of how the DPRK would answer to an immediate threat on the country, on the regime. Uh, it's, it's using larger shells, uh, 600 millimeter uh, shells. Some pundits, some experts, notably uh, Ankit Panda uh, on, on NK News mentioned that this type of counterattack uh, necessitates for North Korea to spread uh, the rocket launchers throughout the territory uh, for it to be efficient. So that's probably a sign we, we will need to, to focus on on the, on the coming weeks. But as a whole, I think what we've seen from the DPRK is really, as, as Manny mentioned, uh, a focus towards weapon that uh, are aiming to answer uh, a localized conflict around the peninsula. Uh, if we think about how, what happened during the pandemic, we, we saw a lot of ICBMs, uh, a lot of weapons, you know, that could uh, flow over uh, Japan, uh, that could target basically the mainland United States. And now recently it's been weapons that could maybe target the island of Guam, uh, Japan, South Korea, but very localized use of weapons. And that goes with this declaration of the end of uh, the unification policy with South Korea being the, the main target. That being said, if we think of what happened at the end of last year and the beginning of this year, we saw tension would raise dramatically because the start of the year was incredibly tense with those uh, shelling near uh, Yonpyeong Island in the, in the west. Uh, and in the end, we've seen, yes, some military action from the DPRK, but not as much as expected. 
This could change, of course. We could see, you know, tomorrow uh, uh, an ICBM test over Japan, or you know, a, a new, a, a new type of uh, missile test and a more direct provocation. But it seems that uh, DPRK now is quite content with the situations as it is going. I mean, it evades sanctions. Its uh, economic relationship with Russia is, is blooming. Um, you know, I, I, I think now the country is in a better position as it was prior to the pandemic, despite, of course, the, the incredible economic hit uh, that, that the, the pandemic represented. So, um, yes, I think a lot of things changed in North Korea, and there's a lot of questions that are uh, unanswered. Right, indeed. And against this backdrop, Mulaney, come May, that would be next month, Seoul may host a trilateral summit with Tokyo and Beijing. Do you believe that this issue, perhaps, that is regarding North Korea, could see some tangible progress during this upcoming trilateral summit? I, I think it might be too much to hope for, to be honest, uh, because lately um, the Korean and Chinese relationship has really, really gotten down. Um, so I think that this trilateral meeting might presumably, presumably more be about improving the um, Korean and Chinese relationships um, and not the least the issue over Taiwan. Um, Recently, both uh, Japan and South Korea has been turning more towards the United States and away from their big brother China. Um, and there has been a lot of issues about particularly Taiwan. And I think that might overshadow the North Korean issue more. So I think what we might be able to hope for in this trilateral, trilateral meeting will be that um, the um, that the Korea and China might improve their relationships a little bit, might become better at talking about the issues that there is uh, in the region more than particularly um, make any kind of big breakthrough regarding North Korea. Of course, North Korea will also be on the agenda. However, I, I doubt that there will be any kind of um, conclusion or uh, any kind of actually effective initiative that might make the situation um, easier in the region. Right, which is why, Nicholas, some pundits say that the trilateral, the upcoming trilateral summit among the leaders of Seoul, Tokyo and uh, Beijing should focus their talks more on economic concerns among the three countries rather than security. How do you respond? Well, I, I tend to agree with Manin that there's a very slight hope uh, to, to see progress on the defense uh, sector. I think the positions are the way they are and there's, there's not a lot that can be done. On the economic side, of course, there's a necessity for uh, communications. The economy uh, are very linked. Uh, and we know also, we've seen on the South Korean side, that even if there uh, is an answer to the United States asking to decouple with China in some very sensitive sectors, th some South Korean companies are actually in China, need to stay in China to, uh, you know, to continue their activity. So I think, yeah, if there's an area of progress for uh, both sides, it is going to be definitely the economic sector and I have very little hope for you know, major progress, major breakthrough, either on Taiwan or on uh, the DPRK issue. Right. And speaking about summits, Nicholas, Russia's Vladimir Putin is poised to visit uh, Beijing in May as well to mark his first diplomatic agenda after winning a fifth term in office. What is the relevance of this upcoming event and what do you believe are its broader implications? Well, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty significant. Uh, it's, it's going to be Vladimir Putin's first visit abroad since he's been uh, elected. Uh, and uh, he announced himself last week actually that he would go. Uh, Sergei Lavrov, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, was in uh, Peking either uh, late, uh, earlier this, uh, this April. We know that Xi Jinping and Putin are really close. Uh, they met more than 40 times. Uh, and, and the broader question, I think, will be, uh, how much China is going to show support towards the Russian uh, war in Ukraine. We know that when uh, Antony Blinken was in Beijing just a few uh, days ago, he mentioned that uh, China has been providing uh, armed parts, weapons parts uh, to Russia, and China has been, uh, you know, of course, yes, showing support to Russia, but also trying to uh, stay in, in between Russia and the West in a way. And we'll see, will uh, Xi Jinping push even further? Will he show, uh, you know, uh, complete support towards this war that has been doing for, for quite some time now? There's also the question of uh, the DPRK. We know Pyongyang has been 
very uh, close to Pyongyang. There's this, you know, Kim Jong-un putting bromance. How does Xi Jinping perceive this? How does China like this or not? We, we could try to see if, if there anything comes out on that matter. And, and uh, what I would look at also if there's a, an increase in economic partnership. Um, the the Russian-Chinese trade uh, has been over $200 billion uh, th this year. It's, it's a big uh, improvement. So we'll see, we'll see where it goes. Again, more questions and very few answers for now then. All right, Nicholas, as always, thank you very much for your time and your thoughts. Thank and Melanie, you, thank you very much for your insights. Thank you. Right, well, that is all the time we have for today. We return same time tomorrow with talks on Korea's labor environment. Thank you for watching.